might remind us of some people we know. It can be difficult to leave your homeland when there's a pretty good chance it'll be much different when you return. But a veteran Russian journalist finds a wealth of perspective working in the United States. A discussion of American values and their emergence in the former Soviet Union next on Times and Seasons. Welcome to Times and Seasons. I'm Susan Furness. And I'm Bob Evans. Thanks for joining us. As one of the wealthiest nations in the world, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year for programs designed to help the poor and disadvantaged. Yet as taxpayers, we rarely feel a sense of ownership in these programs. Perhaps we don't because we're compelled to pay for them. We also see and hear about the abuses that can come with large bureaucracies. As a result, our offerings, our charity, can seem hollow. But in one American city, there's a unique event designed to do what no amount of government dollars can. It is an event based on deep-seated religious traditions. The annual Friendship Fast in Nashville, Tennessee, is helping residents understand the gift of giving. There is no mistaking its size. Nashville, Tennessee is a big city of nearly one million. Still, many call it the biggest small town in America a place where almost any decent person can find somewhere to fit in, to be welcome. Robert Frost obviously never lived in Nashville because there are few fences and plenty of good neighbors. Unfortunately, there are also some of the problems that plague other large cities, hunger and homelessness among them. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes. It is Monday, Maybe and the music at the First Lord Lutheran Church lures listeners inside. People representing care. many religious congregations are Prison. gathered for an interfaith Prison. service marking the beginning of Nashville's third annual Friendship the Fast. Will then answer him, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? The scriptural readings remind those gathered here that service to others is service to God. In an unusual approach to service, Nashville's ambitious interfaith community is encouraging city residents to go without food for two meals, then donate the cost of those meals or food items to local agencies helping the hungry and homeless. One of those is the Second Harvest Food Bank, which provides food for 400 agencies serving the needy throughout Middle Tennessee. It's very unique and it's special because it's so personal. It's something that someone can do and to skip a meal may be a small thing for them, but all of a sudden they realize what it feels like to be hungry, that simply missing one meal and the funds to purchase one meal can make a big difference for someone who's really hungry. The Nashville Fast is patterned after the fast practiced by members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. On the first Sunday of every month, members are encouraged to go without food and drink for a period of 24 hours, and then donate the surplus for distribution to the needy. More importantly, it's a time for intense prayer and worship, for renewing covenants with God and sharing convictions with other members of the congregation. Like other churches, a special Sunday fast is held in conjunction with the citywide Friendship Fast. But I had parents who taught us as children that it was very important to give service and to help others, even in little ways. Members believe that fasting produces humility and amplifies our dependence on God. Ultimately, it turns our focus to others. Maybe taking the time and praying for somebody else and what they need in their life. In the scriptures, um, it states that we should, should fast and pray when we have uh, something that that we are unsure of or we need to ask something of the Lord fast and pray and and think about it and give the Lord the opportunity to answer us well sometimes I'll feel hungry but 
um, I'm, you're, I'm very happy that I can do it because I just like to help people. To learn that your spirit is in control of your body, you have helped yourself to become a more empathetic person of those who are in need, and with that empathy, hopefully, we become a more compassionate people. Compassion abounds at this old converted warehouse in the shadows of Nashville's shiny skyline. The Room in the Inn is a homeless shelter program created by Father Charles Strobel. It is one of the relief programs that benefits from the Friendship Fast. Tonight we have 181, uh, 181 persons going out, and um, they'll be going to all these different congregations. It may be the only shelter program like it in the country. Every night, nearly 200 homeless men and women, divided into groups of 10 or so, are picked up by church groups from all over the city. The homeless are driven to the respective church buildings, provided with a meal, a place to wash, and a safe place to sleep. They are driven back to the inn the next morning. 120 congregations throughout Nashville participate on a regular basis. And over the, over the course of the winter, as people come back night after night after night, you begin to see them coming back to life. You begin to see hope. You begin to see them have a little bit of smile and sparkle in their eyes. And you begin to realize that, that it's not just one particular church, uh, but it's the cumulative effort of all of us together, night after night after night, that begins to restore their human spirit. And that's, um, for me as a Christian, that is a message of resurrection. It has increased the hope of this man. After 16 years on the streets, Steve says he's ready to make the move up. He has a sister in Ohio who worries about him. He wants to go home, but he can't, he says, not this way. He wants to get a job, make some money, be a success. Then he'll go home. He says he's lucky just to have dreams. Most of the street people out here, they, they don't want to talk about their lives. I talked to a few of them about it, you know. I asked them, I said, if you had a chance to get out of this, would you do it? They said, no. And I've had some that says, yeah, I would, you know, but uh, it'll never happen. They don't have no hope. And unless somebody gives them some hope, then they'll be that way until the day they die. You'll find them. I've dreamed many you dreams that never came true. I've them. seen them vanish at dawn. But I've realized enough of my dreams, thank God, to make me want to dream on. I've prayed many prayers when no answer came, although I waited patient and long. But answers have come to enough of my prayers to make me keep praying on. I've drained the cup of disappointment and pain and gone many days without song. But I've sipped enough nectar from the roses of life to make me want to live on. Donations to this year's Friendship Fast have easily topped last year's, and it comes at the right time. Officials report a 15% increase this year in those depending on soup kitchens and homeless shelters. And finally, a footnote before we leave this story. We introduced you to Father Charles Strobel, the Roman Catholic priest who founded and coordinates the Room in the Inn. Father Strobel's mother, Mary Catherine Strobel, was an energetic advocate for the needy of Nashville. Five years ago, she was robbed and killed. Her body was found in the trunk of her own car. The person convicted of the crime turned out to be a homeless man who was benefiting from programs like the Room in the Inn. In all this, Father Strobel has forgiven and remained true to the cause of providing for the spiritual and temporal needs of his fellow men. More ahead on Times and Seasons. Next, we're going to introduce you to Earl and Opal, two fine folks who can make us all look forward to the golden years. And later on, American Postcard takes us to a day on the slopes, the old-fashioned way. After my dad made it clear that biology was more important than baseball, I made my decision. But I missed the 845 to Springfield that day and was starting to think running away wasn't such a great idea after all. Then I saw him. Whistle stop Willie. Rumor had it he was born in a boxcar and spent most of his life crossing the country on trains. So I asked him if, if he were my age again and go could go any place, where he'd most like to go. To school. His answer sent me in a different direction and is one of the main reasons I'm graduating today. Thank you. Learning. It's the smart thing to do.
a message from The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you haven't seen it before, you've done it yourself. Picture some high-strung executive with the weight of corporate America on his shoulders, sparing a few precious moments to catch up on world events with the help of a well-known daily newspaper. But a closer glimpse reveals Mr. Executive absorbed not with the latest coup or the GNP, but with Beetle Bailey, Charlie Brown, and the far side. If laughter is the best medicine, then some folks might consider a quick glance at the comics the most convenient therapy around. For one cartoonist new on the comic strip scene, the key to good medicine is a good prescription. If you were an artist and you could pick, who would you pick for your comic strip? Would they be short or tall or not at all? Would they just be some guys who hang out at the mall? Who would you choose? Well, there are some you'd refuse. You wouldn't choose dogs, and you wouldn't choose cats. There are already comics with plenty of ats. You wouldn't have kitties or typical teens, so please, oh please, no more of those things. For your comic strip niche, go give this a whirl. Find two senior citizens named Opal and Earl. Earl and Opal, Pickle that is. Yes, Pickle's the name, and they wouldn't lie, because they go to church just like you and I. Just another Sunday at the Pickles. Wonder what'll happen next. The only one who knows for sure is Brian Crane. Brian draws for an advertising agency in Reno, Nevada, and dabbles in comic strips on the side. He brought Earl and Opal to life two years ago to fill a void on the comic page. It occurred to me that there's a lot of older people in the, in the country and in the world, and, and uh, their numbers are becoming larger every day, and it's something that uh, all of us hope to be one day, uh, if we're lucky. And uh, plus the fact, I just thought that old pe older people, you know, have a natural humor to them, at least the ones I've known. Well, good idea, but no easy sale. After three rejections, Crane's pickle strip was finally picked up by the Washington Post Syndicate, the only one selected from the 700 strips received by the Post that year. It now runs in 60 daily newspapers in the United States and Canada. Brian uses pickles to treat aging in an inoffensive, humorous way that appeals to all generations. Many of you personally know Opal and Earl. Brian Crane says they're a composite of some people he knows, like his own parents and in-laws. She has kind of a constant battle with Earl because he's retired now. He's used to, to working all day, and so he's, now he's at home uh, getting in her hair, and so he's trying to find his new role in, in this family of, of him, him staying home with her. Ah, so you do know Earl and Opal, don't you? While familiar, they are complex. Though experienced, they are still learning the lessons of life. According to their creator, their daily adventures often speak beyond the initial chuckle. Earl is out there in his garden, and, and he's not really a gardener, but he's grown this plant from a seedling, and he's really proud of it, and he's genuinely interested in this plant. He's, he shows uh, Opal the plant and says, see, uh, I raised it from a seedling. I guess you're not the only green thumb in the family. And, and uh, she looks at it and says, uh, you know that's a weed, of course, don't you? And he looks at it and says, a weed? And then you see him in the next frame uh, stamping it to oblivion, saying, that's too bad, I was really getting attached to it, too. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, to me that kind of gives a different level, you know, if you look deeper, how, uh, you know, labels can affect things. You know, you call something, you know, it can be beautiful, but someone calls it a weed and all of a sudden it's worthless. Ironically, the creator of this senior citizen's niche strip spends most of his waking hours with his wife raising seven children. You know, he is also the I youth leader like in his church. Brian life, says you know, it's part of the reason he appreciates what people. senior citizens uh, like the Pickles have to offer. I think that uh, old people are often overlooked. You know, they have a lot of wisdom to impart, a lot of experience that they can share with us. And so I kind of like to bring them into main, to the mainstream of society through my strip. Mainstreaming has required expansion. 
Brian's syndicator has encouraged him to extend the Pickles family for generational relevance. I like to have strips where, where Earl, you know, has some interaction with his grandson, you know, giving the, the contrast of the two generations. And uh, Earl always tries to play the part of, you know, explaining things to, to his uh, grandson. Of course, what grandmother can't relate to this scene? I've had some uh, people tell me that uh, they, they put pickles on their, on their refrigerator, the ones they like. And uh, I thought that was kind of neat. And so I did a strip about a grandmother who puts things on her refrigerator. To her, these, these drawings are like pieces of artwork, you know, because they're, they were done out of love, you know, by her grandson. And uh, so she's got so many that they, uh, they actually cover the refrigerator. And uh, Earl's looking to find the refrigerator, and he can't find it because they're covered with uh, little drawings. But Grandpa doesn't mind. He's got a soft spot for Nelson. In fact, Earl and Opal can have anything Brian Crane wants them to. And having four clean white boxes to do it with is not an opportunity or responsibility Brian takes lightly. I would like to give that impression that, that older people don't need to, to give up on life. You know, as they get older, I'd like to, to show them doing interesting things, getting involved in, in, in hobbies, taking classes at universities, uh, you know, just doing interesting things to keep themselves, keep their minds you know, active, and I think they, they live longer that way, they live happier lives, and uh, that's what I like to show. So those of you wondering how the successful artist got his start, well, it wasn't until college where he got a job designing bulletin boards. We told you that the Pickles family was getting bigger, but we never introduced you to Opal and Earl's dog. This pickle strip we're about to show you really doesn't have anything to do with life in the golden years, but we thought you might enjoy it just the same. <laughs> I would imagine in all the years you've heard that cliche, you've never heard it associated with a dog. I haven't, Bob, as a matter of fact. <laughs> in just a minute, we'll talk with a Russian journalist about Western religious and cultural values emerging in the former Soviet Union. This is Times and Seasons. Probably tasting better. It's at least fresh brewed. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's okay. okay. Let's yeah. try this. 